Call Mr. Mark Durkin and move the motion. Mr. Durkin. Jeremiah, I'll give the free will you ask John Collier. I rise to propose the motion. People across the North are already suffering due to welfare cuts, many of which are being imposed prior to the introduction of universal credit. This will simply allow the coalition, or sorry, Tory led government to say that their welfare reform in the guise of universal credit will result in more money being paid in benefits. This is a fallacy that seems to have been swallowed and has certainly been peddled by some in this chamber. While this agenda is hurting vulnerable people across these islands, its impact will be even harsher here in Northern Ireland. Two weeks ago, a delegation from my party met Lord Freud and the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State spoke of tweaking universal credit, and we told him that if that was his message, we would oppose it and will actively oppose it. My colleagues told Freud that housing benefit changes would particularly not work given the segregated character of housing in many parts of Northern Ireland. The firm evidence of less access to affordable childcare here, very different and much worse than in England, was a central feature of how here is different and welfare needed to reflect this given the purported purpose of reform is to help people back into work. The levels of disadvantage, disability, need that's emotional, mental and physical from years of conflict, the risk of alienation all mean welfare needs to be different here. That is why we are today calling on this Assembly and Executive to escalate its efforts in opposing the imposition of these draconian reforms here. Let me be clear. The SDLP does not oppose the idea of simplifying the social security process. We do not oppose in any way the concept of getting people back to work when or if they are able. We do not oppose welfare reform. We do oppose unfair reform. And unfair is precisely what many of these reforms are. We have previously in this House debated changes to incapacity benefit entitlement, the assessment of unwell people as fit to work, and the harassment of them to look for it. Little evidence has been received that these work capability assessments do take into account the true effects of some people conditions or their ability to work, particularly in the cases of mental illness and conditions such as Parkinson's, which have fluctuating degrees of severity. We accept the need to prevent people who abuse the system, but we must not create a system that abuses people. Changes to housing benefit are also certain to have a much more pronounced impact over the coming months. The change to the upper age limit for shared accommodation rate has the potential to make homeless thousands of young men and women, or result in them living in Dickensian conditions, sticking with Dickens. Once again, it is a tale of two cities, as the fallout of this cut is going to be much greater here than across the water, given the dearth of HMOs here. These reforms are not about simplifying the system. They are purely a Tory tool to cut costs. The Tories also have great expectations for PIP. The personal independence payments, which are to replace DLA, the expenditure on PIP will be 20 per cent less than that on DLA. That is money coming directly from the pockets of people in need. This restructuring, sorry, reduction is already underway with people being assessed as being able to walk 100 metres after barely demonstrating the ability to walk 10. Northern Ireland has a higher percentage of people on DLA than the rest of the UK, largely attributable to the legacy of the Troubles. We need a unique solution for what is a unique situation. The proposed changes to DLA also throw up many consequences for carers and, in turn, their families who rely on the carers' allowance. Has the government made an estimate of how many carers will be affected, or indeed how much these carers actually save the public purse? 
It is essential, in our opinion, that eligibility for carers' allowance is established through both levels of the PIP daily living component to protect carers and to enable them to continue providing care. These cuts will hurt people who work too. The divide and conquer approach of the coalition government is to portray welfare reform as a move to cut down on scroungers and to gain support from working people to do so. But working families with disabled children, of whom, again, there is a higher percentage here than elsewhere on these islands, will be worse off to the tune of £1,400 per week. Sorry, per year. It's a Freudian slap. <laughs> This, along with the other reductions in benefits, is inevitably going to have a knock-on effect on the wider economy, with people having less money to spend on essentials, let alone small luxuries. Local businesses, shops, cafes, taxis, hairdressers will all share the pain at a time when they are already suffering. The Institute of Fiscal Studies has estimated the cost to the Northern Ireland economy at £450 million. Can we afford this? We support incentives for people to get off benefits. However, there must also be work for people to get into. And I welcome the capital, capital programmes announced by the Executive last week and the jobs that they will inevitably create. The government any government should focus on job creation rather than austerity measures that only serve to perpetuate the dire economic situation. We also do support a simplification of the system, particularly any measure that will streamline the tax credit system, which is a real nightmare, especially for cross-border workers. We are calling on this Assembly to prioritise the issue of welfare reform. We support the establishment or call for the establishment of an ad hoc committee to optimise our ability, collective ability, to scrutinise the bill and the wider welfare reform agenda. This agenda will have effects much wider than the remit of solely the DSD committee. And we believe fuller participation in the committee stage of the bill can help us identify potential wriggle room and chances for damage limitation. While members here are aware of the repercussions of this legislation being handed over from Westminster, the real danger in us blindly accepting it is where it might lead. There is simply too much detail lacking in the Welfare Reform Bill. And when the primary legislation is passed in Britain, it is open to future changes and future abuse. We have seen the lack of social conscience of the current coalition government. Imagine what we might expect from a single party Tory government in future. We do acknowledge attempts made by the Minister <coughs> universal credit where it is due, but they are a safety net, not a solution. Hardship funds need to be more substantial and more sustainable. We will have signed up to parity on Tory terms. This is our chance to get a handle on this and to shape our own primary legislation. Are we not legislators? I am sure every member in this House has at some stage been asked by a constituent or maybe by a visit in school why we got into politics, and I am sure that most, if not all of us, have at some stage given the hackneyed answer to make a difference. Well, let's make a difference, or let's at least try. <laughs>